Okay, so now the floor is open. Please indicate to whom your question is addressed, if it is primarily to someone or other, if I didn't feel that. <coughs> uh, but we do have to ask you to unfortunately step to the podium. I know it's a bit formalistic, but so you can be recorded. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for your talk. And don't mind saying who you are. Oh, um, I'm Nicholas Campio. I teach political science at Fordham University. Um, I wanted to ask a question about the sensibilities. And, um, you know, I teach uh, uh, W.E.B. Du Bois in American political thought. And the notion of a, the American identity is this sort of combination of, of the best of all sorts of different worlds. And I'm, I was curious to know if you could elaborate more what you see as a, a distinct sensibility common among sort of Muslims, how that could enter the American identity, how that would change the American identity, how maybe certain aspects of Muslim sensibilities would have to change. I'm just curious to hear your thoughts about this. Uh, okay, uh, on this one, uh, what I mean by it is, no, I, by, by all means, I do not take some, that there is something called American sensibility. Or that, uh, that it is superior or inferior, or that it brings all together this or the other. No, whatever it is, that Muslims are not yet part of it. So um, I'm thinking that the process of judging, um, sort of in judicial determinations, uh, there are value judgments that choices that are made. For instance, I mean, the, the, the notion that uh, lawyers or judges just simply apply the law and the law is, 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 is I, don't, I don't take that seriously. I think that there is a tremendous indeterminacy uh, in, in legal norms, in any system, and therefore there is a lot of value judgments, uh, what, I, what I call sensibility, without qualifying it as superior or inferior or American or otherwise, whatever it is that is established already for judges who come in, are coming out of these communities and live their lives and went to school and interacted with just the cultural sort of practices of these communities would reflect in their judgments. And again, without saying that is that good or bad thing, but whatever it is that there is, uh, these new immigrants or uh, sort of other African American Muslims who are being historically, traditionally marginalized, socioeconomically and culturally, are not yet part of it. Hopefully, they will be. And it is almost like a, what Andrew would like maybe to see in terms of a social contract idea or contractual idea of. If I'm part of forming an American, this is, let's call it X sensibility. If I'm part of forming the sensibility on which judges draw in coming to their conclusions about what is right and what is fair and what is reasonable, then I'll be bound by the rest of it because I'm part of the process. But if I'm not totally, not yet, Maybe I will, maybe I won't as much as I would like to, but in any case, I'm not even in any minimal sense part of the sensibility formation, you might say, process, then I'm not yet bound by it. Basically, what I'm, I'm trying to get at is this, the, the, the idea of American judges, although um, they, 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 are, they have this notion of separation of religion and the state, and, but they are dealing with religious institutions. What? Religious institutions. Christianity, um, is it has that in, sort of even in Protestant churches, there is a hierarchical institutionalized dimension of leadership, of doctrine, formation, and deliberation that is not true about Muslim communities. Uh, so what is known as the German problem, for example, is that the idea that in Germany today, the state funds religious education through religious institutions. So the Catholic Church conducts religious institution funded by the state. And the Protestant Church also conducts religious education funded by the German state. The Germans have a problem, or the German state has a problem with Muslims. Because they do not have organizations with which, or what we would call counterparts. So the state doesn't know whom to deal with. And in trying to invent a dimension of so to try to organize Muslims or encourage them to become organized in, in, in structural ways, I call it the irony of reinventing the, the millet system. Uh, 
uh, because basically the German state is asking Muslims to become a millet like what Christians used and Jews used to be in the Ottoman Empire. Uh, and that's ironic when European powers challenge German and challenge the Ottoman Empire on this basis, and now they are doing it from to Muslims who live in Europe. So uh, going back, to, I hope that was not too much uh, for the aggression. But the point I'm making here is that this institutional impulse that an American judge who may have grown up in an environment where religious institutions are standard and accepted would have that part of her or his thinking in trying to come to uh, judgment calls about various issues which do not include seriously the, the missing lack of institutionalization. David? <clears throat> Hi, I'm David Nagy. I'm a graduate student in philosophy here. This isn't so much a question as sort of a request to maybe talk about something. You mentioned, you know, living as an American Muslim, but that's not all you, all you are. You're also a professor and have various friends and stuff. So I'm wondering if we could, we could talk about the major differences between the communities of being a Muslim, being a Sudanese, what these communities are, and say the communities of perhaps belonging to a particular institution or a particular profession, where these days there seems to be even some online communities forming along political views or common interests and stuff like that. So if you could talk a little bit about maybe what the differences and similarities are between them and what each can offer or what each can offer, I don't know. Mm. Uh, I think I'm not trying to suggest that there is uh, a substantive or quantifiable sense of um, a uniform Sudanese Muslim identity or American Muslim identity or any collective identity of that nature. Uh, I take it as very fluid and very much con you know, contingent. Uh, but I'm saying that there is a dimension of, of me that is not captured by, because remember I said something about identity being relational that uh, it is not only my assertion of our identity, but also uh, the acceptance of others of that assertion, that in between the two of us, that is what this notion of identity is, is uh, So I'm saying that in, in, in doing so, I'm, I'm, a, I'm missing um, sort of, uh, I mean, if, if uh, perceptions of what it is to be an American Muslim uh, are was supposed to be to exhaust all of who I am, then they may miss aspects of my identity, which I'm not claiming to be part of anybody else's, but mine is for sure. That could be political, it could be in terms of social justice, it could be in terms of, you know, like many of the views that I hold, I do not share with other Muslims. So, so for example, commitment to human rights, that I know that for sure, for, for sure that some Muslims do not share that commitment. But, but if I am if I am identified primarily as a Muslim, either those people are included in my commitment to human rights, or I'm excluded, uh, or that part of my commitment is excluded from the perception of my identity. Uh, and, and that's what I'm trying to, 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 to caution against: that there is more to to me than being a, a Muslim. There is more to me than the fact that being American or Sudanese or anything else. I mean, there's, there's always more to me than you know, not me person, but every one of us. But let us let us try to um, um, sort of appreciate that dimension. By by the way, the analysis I'm, I don't want at this stage already. Andrew has drawn so many holes in it, but. Uh, my assertion, I believe, crosses over to race, crosses over to gender. My claim is beyond minority politics, I believe, can apply any type of identity formation. Uh, that there's more to me than being a woman, there's more to me than being an African American, and all of that. So if, if that is the case, then I hope that maybe what I say, I'm saying about Muslims may trigger uh, thinking about these questions in, in, in broader terms. And at that point, really, I think we'll have a good conversation going. And Bushehid is making his okay, way to. I'm sorry, I hope this doesn't deter anyone from asking a question. They need to. Yeah, Mujahid, uh, we had communications. Yes. <laughs> I remember. 
Uh, yeah, I'm going to uh, follow up on Andrew's one of his main criticisms, and that has to do with authority. Mm -hmm. Once you release uh, Muslim understandings of Islam from a misconstrued authority, from a certain structure, then by demolishing that authority, then you are depriving yourself from any authority to which you want them to subscribe to, to you know, cling on to. And so once you truly remind people the fact that Islam doesn't have a central authority, no final authority to the conscience, then you simply have to accept their life words, their practices as you know, immigrants, since they don't know, they don't fully engage. You have to be simply patient and uh, maybe you can be active participate in encouraging them towards becoming more American. But you, you won't have a ground to make the authoritative call uh, for a certain direction uh, to the more, you know, working with conscience rather than through the authority of text and so on. Yes. So uh, how do you deal with that? And my second thing has to do with your three stories. I thought they were interesting. And the first one was access to mosques, women being denied access to mosques. The second one was a uh, child with uh, Down syndrome, parents, mm -hmm. daughter, burial, mother is denied. It's not allowed to be on the side. And the third one is marriage to non Muslim. Now, uh, it's very interesting that the women who wanted to change something in the conception of the existing community, mosque community, they, when they go to police, which is an American figure in this story, that figure is not able to make the intervention, fails to open the path to them. And in the second story, we have uh, this, you know, again, problematic situation. The third story seems to solve those problems, I believe. In which case, you, as a Muslim, as a scholar, and someone who can cite Quran, speak to these people, offer them as a kind of ground on which they can feel legitimate. Marriage becomes, you know, you basically naturalize it, normalize it by offering an Islamic ground for it. So my kind of overall conclusion from those three stories is, is that as long as demand calls for change within Muslim world or is, you know Islamic community, local or general, come from outside as something that is challenging, as something that appears as secular or American or un-Islamic, it, it, it basically becomes inconsequential. It, it, it doesn't lead to transformation. Only when you come, you approach it from within Islam, then you have this transformative impact. So uh, your calls for secularism make sense to American audiences, but not the same impact, it doesn't have the same impact on uh, Muslim audiences. And so perhaps it has to do with this problem of speaking from within versus mm -hmm. from outside. Thank you very much. Uh, actually, I think I'm glad you, you you saw the third story in that light because that solves the problem of authority, uh, or rather, that would be my response to the question of authority. For me, the authority is in the eyes of the beholder. There is no external source to release authority uh, in the Muslim sense, and that is historical as well as contemporary. That it's only my willingness to concede that authorize position or all of you. So my ability to persuade is the basis of my authority claim. And it is by persuasion that is authoritative, not me who is authoritative. So when I went to the family in their, home, in their home and talked to them about marriage, and my ability to persuade them, and I think their need to accept what I was also proposing, because I could see that the family was looking for a way out as well. So the, the, the need for a solution and that the plausibility of a solution is what constituted the authority. Now, there is something that I didn't want to get into the technical side, but I think that, that often a, a dramatic way of saying it that makes the point that in the Sunni tradition, Imam Shafi'i is credited with having formulated usul fiqh, or at least the most authoritative statement of the principle. And in particular, his, his book, uh, Rizal, which was sort of a thesis on the methodology of Islamic thinking and derivation of, of rules from sources of the text, 
But the actual, the historical experience is very interesting. That that book remained totally marginal and unauthoritative among Muslim scholars for 100 years after, after Shafi'i died. So I say that Shafi'i did not know that he was Shafi'i. That the idea is that Shafi'i was one of many young men who went to mosques and sat around scholars and learned, and many scholars who spoke their views and, and so on. It is gradually over time, intergenerationally, that those views got to be accepted. And their survival and acceptance and utility is what made them authoritative, not the figure of Shafi'i. And that none of the figures of the so-called founders of the Sunni schools was authoritative in their own lifetime. They were tortured, they were imprisoned, they were uh, just, or just uh, money. And the fact that the, the mechanics of it too, I mean that all of their writings were written by their students and attributed to their masters. So that Abu Hanifa, for example, did not write the text. It was Shibani and uh, Abu Yusuf and who wrote the, the Abu Hanifa's views and transcribed them. So the, the, the founding of the school is ascribed to the founder uh, retrospectively. So that for me is what, what, what the spontaneous nature of the religious authority is in that when it evolves through acceptance over time, it becomes authority. But it, and therefore, it is difficult to capture it in an institution. Uh, so I think that about, about the stories, uh, uh, yes, I think uh, I'm glad you, because I am going to add that now to my storytelling. I mean, when I tell the story about the marriage, uh, I'm going to say how that this the question, might explain the question of authority. That, those, that family, by the way, never saw me before. I mean, it was. Their, their daughter-in-law who called on me, uh, having been my law student uh, at some point, and so in fact they gave me direction to their home, and I went and drove my way to their home, and I found them all together, and including the young man, and, and the young girl, and the woman, and so we sat and I started talking and answering their questions and trying to explain why they shouldn't feel uh, inhibited by this uh, cultural practice that has been institutionalized into a Sharia principle. Uh, and I think through that, I think that uh, the fact that they were persuaded is what made it authoritative to them. Uh, and that means that any of us can do this all the time, anytime, uh, which I think for me it is tremendously liberating, that I don't have to go to someone's. You see, Americans often say, why don't you constitute a council that declares Muslim doctrine? I think that's a very dangerous proposition. Because what happens if you don't like what they pronounce? So it's, you are assuming that the doctrine they will announce will be favorable to whatever, you know, you want, they, you want them to condemn jihad, they do that. But then they do, do something else which you hate. But you have declared them authoritative. How can you take it back? Okay, um, we have to have you. Um, first, we have here, we have four women in a row. Um, no, first, first, Hi, I'm Abby Rui, Hunter College. It's such an honor to see you. I've been inspired by your work forever, so it's very, I'm very excited to be here. Um, I was just wondering, sort of building on the comment of inside and outsiders, I was wondering what your thoughts were on some of the work that has been done on seeing sort of each cultural group as partial and incomplete. So like Boaventura de Sousa Santos talks about sort of Mestiza conception of human rights to, to sort of deal with the, difference, the issue of difference, finding equality in a world of difference, to enrich your understandings without making everything the same. And there's actually been a ton of work by feminist scholars like Brooke Ackerley that have done similar things, talking about inside and outside and multi-sided critics. And I was just wondering if you have looked at any of that stuff or where, whether you're um, whether your current work is going in that direction, or how are you, how are you, I was, I was interested by what you said about not wanting to give Arabic uh, precedence over English, or vice versa, and wondering if that kind of an approach would be one way of dealing with that. Mm. Thank you. Uh, uh, for me, it's a problem. I don't know what the, the answer is going to be, because I, I, I don't like the inside-outside dichotomy. Uh, 
I can't claim knowledge of the literature or the field or understanding. I, I know Santos and, and other people, but I, I don't think I can claim familiarity enough to say that I sort of systematically subscribe to this view of honor. But my, my instinct is to resist uh, the notion, the cutting of the inside or outside, because I know some insiders are more insiders than others, and more outsiders than insiders. Uh, so the question of the color of my skin or the accent I speak in does not really give me sort of an authenticity and an authority that someone who doesn't have my accent or my color skin doesn't have by virtue of that skin or, or so it is I think it's people's commitment that defines or, or defines what they say as uh, persuasive or not. So so the, the, about I always argue that, that Inter internal actors, but that is not defined so ethnically or geographically, but people who use an internal logic of the tradition are more likely to be more persuasive than more those who don't. Uh, and I, I think, like, for in some work that I did with other colleagues, we call it we call the idea of agents of social change. People who live the life and have the commitments to social justice and to uh, empowerment of that community on its own terms are the people who are more likely to be authoritative to that community or persuasive to that community. And I think our task, where we are not those people, uh, is to try to reach them and to uh, sort of influence them, maybe empower their discourse. Like what we did with this uh, notion of rights at home, the, the idea of the project was the idea that if human rights are not lived at home, they are not going to be protected anywhere else. And therefore, okay, who are going more likely to influence gender relations and socialization of children in the very in intimate environment of the immediate families? People who live in that community are part of that community who, and so on. So that, that is the, 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 so I hate to, I don't like to uh, identify with the dichotomy of internal insider or outsider, but it is more about the sort of arguments we use, the sort of frame of reference. And we have a bunch of uh, first Jean and then, and then Ahmed. Yeah, uh, Jean Cohen, uh, professor of political theory at Columbia University. Um, well, I have a few. Not, not necessarily interrelated questions. I have to say that I haven't heard um, or figured out what you think is distinctive about your your immigrant experience than all the other immigrant experiences of, of other groups. Um, you met you you alluded to something being distinctive, but I haven't heard what it is yet. I, I said immigrants. I'm not talking about African Americans. Mm. That's not okay. Um, and all of the problems. And, and, and th that they had to face or, or continue to face, and there are immigrants from other places as well. And so I, have, I, I don't quite see yet what the distinctiveness is um, uh, of, 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 of your experience, either as a Muslim or as an African. Um, the second thing is uh, that um, I'm, I'm, I really like to hear a bit of clarification on what a Muslim sensibility is and why Muslim somehow uh, Muslim sensibilities are not um, uh, integrated or accommodated or uh, you know brought into uh, either legal decisions or or uh, I don't know general culture. I mean if if it's uh, I don't if if there's a similarity and I suspect there is to other immigrant groups and other religions, then this is, as you said, would be a question of time in terms of the general culture. But I don't know what it would mean, and I would be very nervous about uh, uh, the influence on actual state law. So I'm sort of you know, worried about that, what that would mean. And then uh, there's the issue of, um, you yourself said that, well, there are certain things um, that you could pull that off in terms of the marriage. Uh, I don't know nothing about Islam law, but anyway, that you could pull that off in terms of marriage because you could show, in terms of the text, something wasn't there. But you also said that there's certain things you couldn't pull that off with um, because the things are there. Uh, now that would imply to me two things. Uh, one is um, you'd have to say the hell with the text. 
uh, if you're if if with the stake of a certain fundamental rights or things you care very strongly about, um, and that would also have to imply that you'd have to look elsewhere than the text. Um, and since you are um, uh, a uh, since there are multiple sources of, of your identity and everybody else's here and, these, and everywhere, I suspect, then um, looking towards other sources would not be looking outside. It would be looking towards what's available to you here as whatever, as an American, as I don't know, Washington, et cetera, et cetera. Not Washington, where are you from? Atlanta. What? Atlanta. Atlanta, Atlanta right. Whatever, it's a <laughs> um, So, uh, so <laughs> that was a joke. So, so I think you see my drift. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm curious to know, uh, have some kind of sense, more concrete. Um, because what I, I picked up on, to be honest, was it a tension, a general tension, and you picked up on um, some of these, between, on the one hand, uh, a really kind of strong, actually, multicultural discourse, and on the other hand, a rejection of it. And I don't see how this has been resolved in your presentation. Mm. Uh, thank you. Uh, let me, uh, just briefly on the Muslim sensibilities, I don't believe that there is such a thing. Oh. I didn't claim that. Uh, I just in the, in the preceding comments, I tried to say that I'm not claiming that there's a uniform, monolithic, identifiable, quantifiable Muslim sensibility. I said that the immigrant sensibilities of people coming from Africa and South Asia, and, and by the way, this may be the part that you didn't get in my accent, when I said that, one difference that Muslim immigrants have from other earlier religious minorities or religious immigrants is that they are visibly different because they are ethnically different, they are not European. But, but there was tremendous racism against Europeans, Southern European Italian. I understand. I understand, yes. I, I, I understand. But I'm saying that at least that, in fact, if, if, if you heard me in my original remarks, I said that's a question to me that I am looking for an answer to. I did not affirm it as a, as a statement, conclusion. To say that I wonder if the visible minority dimension is going to make a difference. I raise it as a question at that level. Uh, on the question of, uh, I, don't, I hope I've not looked, uh, would you, I mean? Uh, 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 well, so the well, first was distinctiveness of this. Oh, yes, the sentiments. No, 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 I'm not claiming the sentiments. Uh, I'm just claiming difference. Uh, no, but difference is not the same as the sentiments. Is it? No, is everything different distinctive? Oh, I don't know. Uh, so, okay, so my point is this, that uh, people with different history, but for one thing, Muslims come from colonial backgrounds, post-colonial backgrounds. That's a big difference. I mean, to come from Europe, from European origin is not the same as to come from South Asian or African origin. That uh, experiencing colonialism consciously, psychologically, emotionally, as well as materially, does make a difference to our perspectives, to our outlooks, to our sense of priorities. And not having been a post-colonial subject, I don't think that you can, you can really... They are post-colonial. They are not. But, America is post-colonial. No, it is not. It is colonial, not post-colonial. Because America is a product of a successful colonization. The United States, you and everybody in this room who are a product of this culture is a product of a successful displacement of original population by an immigrant colonial population. So you are not a post-colonial subject. I am, and, 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 but that does not give me a, a privilege or a, a rank. It is just simply, it means that my experience is different from yours. All I'm saying about sensibility, it is not that there's a distinctive Muslim sensibility that has to inform American law, but that, that my different sensibility, and I'm not claiming it is to be true about all people of, of my background, but I'm saying that it takes generations of people to go into the education system, to make it into law school, to make it into law practice, to become judges, in order to infuse these experiences in the legal system and way of thinking. I, I don't think that, uh, that, that to me, uh, uh, that the idea of judicial determinations is not 
uh, sort of a purely calculated uh, sort of conclusion based on uh, sort of textual reading of, of a statute. There's a lot of values that go into a judgment. Values that go into a judgment. And those values are informed by cultural experience. And that difference could influence the conclusion that people make about what is appropriate and what is not in relation to a state entanglement with religious doctrine or lack of it. I think we want to just introduce a few more voices. Mm. Some more, please. Hi, uh, I'm Hajra Shakat. I'm a student at the School of Public Health at College. Um, and I was actually interested in the identity of community, as, as even as a Muslim community, because from my experience, I know that, and, and you alluded to this when, in, in your as an example that even when you look at the mosques and within the Muslim community, you have this factions based on where the immigrant population came from, if they were immigrants or if they were here. Um, and I'm interested in knowing that if, if you've looked at that, it, I guess that to another perspective is that for the group of Muslims that identify more with their culture than they do with Islam, because if you come here and you're from a different, from another um, cultural background, you may spend your entire life saying, you know, I, I'm, I'm Pakistani, and not associate with the Muslim community that's already here, even if it's a Pakistani Muslim community. And I'm wondering if you have taken that into consideration, this, that kind of, this sort of uh, separation between your culture and your religion, because I know, personally, I've seen many examples where people will identify with the culture, even if it's from a Muslim country, and not necessarily say, but I'm a Muslim here too. And, and that's, that's a distinction. And I'm wondering if you've looked at that and if, uh, how you think that relates to also our participation here, um, whether it's democratically or as part of the society in terms of embedding, becoming as part of the Muslim community into more so the American community. Uh, uh, I, I do have, I don't know if, if I did in, in writing about this book in particular or not, but I, I am concerned with that problem. And to me, the difficulty is how to dis disentangle the cultural from the religious. Um, and this may be going back to what, what some of the remarks that Andrew was making about the theological claims I'm making. That uh, I think that. Um, the, the, my, my sense is, is radically the individual of, of theology in that uh, it is true that we, we have views that are expressed and that come to prevail and become more authoritative than other views, but it's always an individual choice whether or not to accept any of them. And it is always an individual responsibility for that choice. So that when I say that you can never advocate responsibility for religious choices you make or fail to make, uh, I think that to me that that is an anchor of what, what I would call my theology, meaning that uh, what, uh, obviously some views will influence people more than other views. And those views may become authoritative not by their source, not by their classification, by anybody other than the person who accepted them. So the persuasiveness of positions is what gives them authority to the people who are accepting them for themselves. Uh, so when you say that American Muslims who come with uh, Pakistani cultural identity, and uh, I wonder what Islam is other than as it is lived and experienced by the culture that you, 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 uh, you grow up in. Uh, I mean, is there a way I am like, Put this as a question to any of us. Is there sort of a pristine, abstract Islam that's out there that is not already implicated in culture? So that dichotomy, I don't see how it can happen. Susan, and I think this may be our last question with both speakers. Uh, I want to first thank both speakers because I think it's been extremely interesting at a very high level and I've been happy to be here. Uh, I, my name is Susan Buck Morris, I think we're supposed to say. Um, and uh, I'm here at the Graduate Center. 
what I would like to get back to is something that Andrew raised in his comments when he said there was a tension in your paper between uh, at one point you're saying this is absolutely true and another saying, well, this is only my opinion. I don't think that that contradiction is necessarily a uh, Kantian antinomy that makes it impossible to argue one or the other, uh, but it's something that I've been wrestling with myself in a rather different context. I mean, I do find uh, Mohammed Taha's distinction between revelation, uh, which would be this kind of absolute, this, this, in other words, the law has to be precisely understood. I would like to introduce a, a word for that kind of uh, interpretation, which would be exegetical, as opposed to hermeneutic. And I, I don't know if that's I mean, in some kinds of theological discourses, that works. Um, and for my own purposes, I need to make some sort of a distinction between what would be objectively there in the law or in the text, right? And what is a question of hermeneutics that is an opinion? Mm. Um, obviously, in a certain sense, they cannot be held apart, not in any um, uh, rigorous logical sense, but perhaps in a phenomenological or cultural sense, they have to be, um, uh, which would indicate, for instance, that um, you used one word in the last question and answer, you, you spoke of authenticity, and then you corrected yourself and said authority, right? So, Authenticity is on the same side as exegesis of something that is actually objectively there, right? And this other notion of authority depends on whether people accept it or not, and it's a much more la vie, much more um, fungible uh, category. Um, and I think that one of the difficulties, one of the lacks of sensibility in, let's say, even academic discourse in the United States today, is that there is no way to talk about something that's objectively there. Everything is hermeneutically interpretable, uh, or too post-Heideggerian, too post-Nietzschean, to allow for something to be objectively there in the text, in some sort of, um, in some way which still demands exegesis, but does not uh, turn into a simply an opinion. Mm. Um, and I, so this is a kind of question to both of you, uh, because I think that some of the difficulty of the discussion has nothing to do, because we're all academics here, and taking the part of you, or part of all of us that are academics and not other, right? Uh, there's something in the discussion today which makes it very difficult to produce that kind of distinction without being um, thrown into uh, the need of saying authenticity in some sort of absolutist way. I don't want to go on much longer, but I hope that both of you will respond, uh, if you can, to what I'm trying to say. Shall I start? Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. I, I think that that's helpful in bringing me back to, to something that Andrew was talking about in terms of... The reason I mentioned uh, the precise nature, I'll talk about Hudud uh, specifically, because the claim there is that uh, these extremely harsh punishments are justified because they're absolutely precise. And that, and because they bring a sense of balance and um, transformative justice, uh, that justifies the, the harshness of the punishment. And when I say, when I make that claim about the absolute nature of law and that objective sense, in order to repudiate it for me, the argument I'm trying to make is this. Yes, they may be, and I believe that there is a dimension to the law that is precise, that is objective and, and pre-existing before human judgment. But there is no access to it except through human judgment. So what I call human agency, for me, therefore, the divine ceases to be divine by entering into human consciousness. But it doesn't like a certain otherness. Yes. Which the hermeneutic uh, post Nietzschean position gives co us. Correct. It doesn't, but it is inaccessible otherwise. So 
I mean, how do we find it out? So when I say that the device is to be divine, when it enters human consciousness, so the claim that you know exactly what the hard punishment is, which is the only claim that justifies the harshness of the punishment, is not something that anybody else can verify. So another way of putting it, I say that truth cannot be adjudicated. That you have to accept it or reject it, but there is no way that you can judge what is true and what is not, other than ultimately always in terms of your own personal choice. So that the, the uh, I, I oppose the application of the rule because I argue that it is not possible for a human institution to discover and to apply the precise nature of hadood that justifies their application. Uh, so they are, they are too precise for human judgment to capture. And, and that is the basis of my claim, my, channel, my opposition to them. Uh, but overall, it is uh, also the, 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 the question about how the nature of Sharia, yes, a point that might help. I know that I cannot cover all of Andrew's remarks, but my critique of legal pluralism and that Islam law is not law uh, is that. That was a question, not a critique. Yeah. For me, it is not law because it always takes the agency of the state to make it law. Okay, <laughs> So, uh, meaning, that's why I talk about legal pluralism and normative pluralism. So for me, Islamic law, what we call Islamic law, which I, I, by the way, I try to avoid the term, I always try to call it Sharia. Because Islamic law already implies that it is law. And I believe that it can never be law, and that it, see, it loses the quality of being Sharia by the act of enacting it as a state law. Because it becomes the political will of the state, not the biggest law of the Muslim believer. Uh, which is as uh, a matter of individual choice. So normativity to me is different from legality. And that Sharia is normative but not legal. And that when you enact it into legal, you drop it of the quality of being normative. For those, because it becomes, the, and I think that the, the very uh, dramatic example, a tragic example of it, is, sorry, to, uh, I'll just take a minute to, to explain this is the notion of uh, proof of zina, of uh, extramarital sexual relations, uh, the difference between the Malik school and the other Sunni schools. The, the other three Sunni schools insist that circumstantial evidence can never be sufficient for proof of sexual impropriety. Only the Malik school accepts circumstantial evidence. But it is a very significant difference because uh, if you happen to be in a manical jurisdiction, one can be convicted of, of this crime on the basis of circumstantial evidence like proof of pregnancy without proof of marriage, which happened to Amina Lawan and other women in Nigeria, northern Nigeria. Whereas if you happen to live in any of the other Sunni jurisdictions, accusing someone of this crime without producing four witnesses to the actual act of after intercourse is the other hard crime of us, which is unproven accusation of So he, he is like, but it's a very simple. So, so here is a very ironic situation where what or something on which someone can be sentenced to death in one jurisdiction can be the basis of another crime in another jurisdiction. So which is Sharia? Uh, because of the impossibility of discovering what Sharia is precisely, other than our, what our understanding of it is, we should not talk of it as law. We should talk of it as law. And therefore, it is influential on those who accept it to the degree that they accept it. Uh, so I, I say that there should not be two parallel legal systems in any state. That the legal system of a state should be uniform and secular. And, and then people can have, uh, and by the way, all of us have multiple normative commitments. And all of it negotiate our multiple normative commitments in relation to the absolute authority of state law uh, as, as, as binding on, on everyone, but by virtue of its being uh, the authority of the state that made it law. 
uh, and maybe also maybe Andrew can comment on what is now a, a criticism of the yeah. Uh, so I'm, I'm uh, there was so much that was that was rich in, in, in the, the last set of comments that it sort of um, got me thinking that you know your book uh, towards an Islamic Reformation about eighty nine uh, ninety yeah yeah and so you know it, the idea of talking about Islam and reform, or reforming Islam, or Islam and the reformation of this, so that comes so easily to our tongue right now. It's as if we can't really speak about Islam without speaking about its need for reform in one way or another. It strikes me that when you have the particular issues related to a legalistic, uh, as opposed to institutionalized uh, religion, like Islam. So when we talk about reforming Christianity, it was a rejection of an institution uh, that was, of course, bound up in certain theological uh, uh, revolutions as well. You can't have a revolution in Islam or, or a reformation in Islam against a church that doesn't exist. So what you're talking about is certain kinds of practices and norms and judgments that are presumed to have not just the weight of cultural authority, but to have some sort of grounding in a tradition that I have no problem calling legal, but let's just call it doctrinal or, or in the realm of practical ethics. So a common way of approaching this is to imminentize the problem of normativity, to make Islam somehow closer to, to nature. So when somebody like Tariq Ramadan writes a book called Radical Reform, uh, his move is not to say we can't understand God, we can't understand the Quran. It's that we have a we have too many ways of understanding it, that it's this kind of it's this kind of uh, it's overflowing with normativity and we almost can't go wrong because Islam is full of so many purposes, so many values, that we shouldn't limit it to any formalistic sense, but it's not a, it's not a radical epistemic crisis. It strikes me that Abdu's tack is the opposite. It's to take the traditional Islamic insistence on transcendence. God is so different from us. God is so other that we, we, we don't believe in natural law. We don't believe in the authority of reason. But he's taking this, tr this transcendence and radicalizing it to such an extent that it almost dissolves the authority of God's own speech. So it almost reminds me of some of Hobbes, mm -hmm. right? Or a lot of early modern. So after the Reformation and after you know, the Calvinist turn, you have, you, know, you have this radical skepticism, not only about Aristotle, but also about human knowledge as such. It strikes me that in some cases, that's your approach to Islamic reform, is to say be precisely, it's not because our reason is so sanctified or so valuable or so natural, it's that God is so different that we can't, even revelation can't possibly bear the imprimatur of God's authority. That's pretty astonishing that that's right. The only thing I would ask, though, is it strikes me that when there's certain things like the Hadud punishment, certain new punishments that you want to say, well, it seems to say you have to do this. But as soon as we start to enact our own judgment in matching circumstances to text, God's authority immediately vanishes, almost like some kind of observer's paradox. As soon as we're there, God kind of flees. And since the only grounds for implementing these things in the first place was that this is what God commands, as soon as we enter into it, God no longer commands it. The problem is, I wonder, I mean, so I'm happy with that, and, and, and so is Gene Cohen, I can tell, but, um, but then it seems like there's other cases where you want to say, but no, the text says you have to have four witnesses to intercourse before you can punish for adultery, so you can never punish for adultery. But it's not because the text is um, inscrutable. It's that it's perfectly screwed. Or that if the text actually about marriage doesn't say that it's only men that can marry 
um, non-Muslims, then therefore the text establishes that you can. So I'm just wondering whether this kind of radical transcendence that, you're, that you seem to be suggesting, where we really not only can't know God, but we can't enact any portion of God's agency, I wonder if that is only for the things that you don't like. Mm. Uh, I, I, I don't know. I know it is made. And yeah. uh, let, let me just take a very quick. Uh, I, I, the problem is I'm, I'm, I'm shifting between two positions. One is to say that for those who accept this argument, Europe, your position cannot stand in value. That, that is, for those who accept the authority of the text, I'm saying that you can never really establish the authority of the text in a way that is true to the text. But that is not my position. That is your position because you claim that Hudud are the precise law of God. If that is true as you claim it is, then your ability to discover what that is is always uh, at fault. So for me, I, I, I try to show the, the fallacy of the immutability of Sharia <coughs> by sort of, sort of, as a matter of, for the sake of argument, I say, if you accept the authority of the text, then you will find that you cannot really discover what that authority is. And, and historically, the Muslim scholars have always said that Sharia is unknowable. That uh, I think Andrew will know this term, and some of you may do too. They say that uh, uh, that is the, the Sharia law is always suppositional. Zundi. Not always, though. There are Zendi norms, and there are. But, 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 but <laughs> what is Zendi? Yeah, so there is supposed to be a decision between what Zendi and that is what is between suppositional and categorical. But that that classification itself is Zendi. That is, how would you know what is suppositional and what is not, other than your own judgment, which is a supposition? Uh, so it is the unknowability of Sharia that makes it unlegislatable as Sharia. That when you, when you render the norm into a legal language, the language of the statute is the norm, not the norm as, as, as it on its own. And a very quick example, I know that our chair is very anxious about this. Uh, in 2000, as recent as that, in 2000, the Egyptian parliament enacted a statute that introduced the notion of khula, uh, that is the ability of women to buy themselves out of a bad marriage by renouncing their financial entitlements. So this particular type of, of marriage, of, of termination of marriage, has always been part of Sharia. But it was not available to Egyptian women until the Egyptian state said, you can have this. So the right became Egyptian law not because it was Sharia, but because the Egyptian state said so. That's why the law is always the state. It is not. It is never God. Uh, it is not that God doesn't have a normative uh, sort of principle for us to abide by, but that principle is to, for us to discover individually and be responsible for and accountable for individually. It is not for us to discover institutionally and provide for legally. And that's what I mean by the normativity of Sharia and the, the fallacy of immutability of Sharia too. Because any understanding of the Sharia is a human understanding. It cannot be otherwise. Okay, that's a good place to end. We'll continue upstairs on uh, 5109. And please join me in thanking both speakers for a very special.